We're going to move on as, as speedily as possible because we do have so much that we want to fit in. And, and what we're going to do now is hear about some findings from the literature in terms of sexual safety. This will be a worldwide pers perspective. And I'll bring forward now Professor Jayashree Kulkarni, who's the director of Manish Alfred Psychiatry Research Center, known, I suspect, to most, if not all of you. I, I just have to say as you're coming up that um, Professor Kulkarni is yet another example of how I am ignoring luminary bios. So do yourself a favor and read about all these amazing women, but I'm going to keep it short so we get through everything. <laughs> Professor Kulkarni, please join us. Thanks very much. Uh, look, I'm delighted to be here and to be speaking about this. This sounds very dry as dust consideration from the literature and research, but hopefully I can um, bring some perspective and life to this very, very important area that I'm incredibly passionate about and have been for many decades now. And if you will indulge me, I wanted to let you know a little bit about my own clinical reflections and why I've come to this area, um, giving away my age as, a, as an old person. I was a psychiatry registrar in 1984, began my training then and got my FRA and ZCP in 1988. At that time, I did a lot of my training at what was Prince Henry's Hospital and it merged with what was Queen Victoria Hospital and they both became Monash Medical Centre, but it was near here, it was up along here. At Prince Henry's Hospital, the emphasis in my training um, was very much about a Freudian sort of training and it left me absolutely cold because we were told such things as if a woman discloses that she's had a lot of abuse and difficulties in her background, that is just a fantasy and it was to be um, dismissed. And that um, nobody could have such a bad story and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what some of the training was about. At the same time, of course, I met some wonderful people and Dr Sandra Hackel who um, uh, continued to be a psychiatrist at the Alfred Hospital, uh, was one of my early mentors. Now, she intervened for me when I was having supervision with my male um, supervisor who asked me to sit on his lap and played with my hair uh, in supervision. And being blunt as I am, and it gets me into trouble, I turned to him and said, but you're an old dude, I'm not interested, and walked out. Now, what that ended up with me happening was Sandra was very instrumental in, in um, rescuing me because I thought, well, I'm going to go back to emergency medicine. That was my love at the same time. Um, I've had psychiatry. This is terrible. I'm not interested. And she said, no, no, give it another go, but go to another place. And we organised for me to go to Royal Park Hospital. There I worked in the John Cade unit. And I have to say that looking back on the way we managed a whole heap of people at the time, it was that was the standard treatment. And I've got to say, I, I am appalled at what some of the things that happened. Um, I'm not at all happy with what happened. And it really lit a fire in my belly about, we need to do this better. Um, there was a whole lot of... Um, there were a whole lot of issues and it ended up with me working in the women's uh, back ward, as it was called back then. And it was a brilliant experience because what I learned from a number of very, very wise women who had been in the hospital, and those days the, the stays were very long, uh, uh, was incredible. So, you know, we worked together on such things as thinking about how could we improve the lot for women with psychosis? And that's what I did my thesis on. So I started in the area of psychosis, but listened to a number of the stories of the hardships, the, the traumas, um, the awful, awful stories. And um, again, have kept in touch with some of those um, particular women who obviously since then have not um, remained in hospital. The clinical observations that, that you know, we make the international research that is documented is part of this process. But for my point, the fire in my belly is still burning because I, I can't stand the thought of injustice. Um, as an Asian, dark-skinned female, I've had my share of rubbish. Um, I still am lectured to by male colleagues who tell me that I and dangerous with getting registrars to think about trauma stories in their patients. Um, you know, we, we still fight the battles. We 
got a sort of collective of female psychiatrists who, who band together and shake our heads and uh, try to move this cause and campaign on. But one of the things that I've found is that we're not alone in this situation. There is a worldwide problem with um, assaults and other problems that, that uh, women should never have to face and are facing. The decreasing length of stay on inpatient units, the increasing acuity, that is people being very, very sick when they come onto um, hospital wards, uh, is a big problem everywhere. Uh, in my role as the president of the International Association for Women's Mental Health, I get to meet with colleagues around the world and look at situation around the world. There are mixed gender wards in the US, in Europe, in New Zealand and Australia, and the same issues of assault, mainly against women, are there across the world. What's interesting is when I talk with my colleagues in the UK, and I've seen their, some of their data, um, that in fact they went to that gender segregation um, model in 2008 and uh, their rates of assault against women uh, has decreased. Now, it's, it, did inquire, it did require an injection of funding um, and uh, rebuilding of units and I think you know, we could easily do it. I'm listening for a promise, a commitment of funding haven't heard it yet, but you know, again, um, wiser, cooler heads tell me to just keep hanging in there. I have been hanging in there since the 1990s working on this issue, so you know, my patience is wearing very thin, but we need to keep going on this campaign. Um, the gender segregation issue in the UK was prompted by the research uh, survey, the National Patient Survey that was done, and provided the evidence. So again, this whole process the documentation in front of you, the um, methodology which I stand by because it was my senior researchers and myself involved is very sound um, evidence-based work. I've also been talking with other people around the world, my colleagues in India, where there's a huge problem with uh, women having a second-rate citizenship status mainly, and there are huge problems with rape and uh, in the general community, but in the psychiatry wards, interestingly, a family is admitted with the patient. So uh, at all times, the family members are there. They sleep next to the, the identified patient. They feed the patient, as in bring in food, um, and are part and parcel of the whole care. And that, therefore, means that there is some protection. Of course, if there is intra-family assault, then you have another issue. But often what happens there is that there are extended family members, etc., involved. So that's how they get around that. In our international uh, women's mental health congresses, our colleagues from the Middle East and other Asian, and, and Asian countries just shook their heads at us and said, this is a ridiculous problem. You have brought this problem on yourself. Why don't you just have male and female wards? And they just say, well, that, you know, that's just where it's at. What are you doing? So why do this review? And um, this is an important quote by the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission of Australia in 1993. So you can see where my impatience um, is, is, uh, is there because coming from this, a number of other things happened. For some of us older folk, we were involved in the tailoring services for uh, women document and working party in 1996. Um, so, you know, the, the issue's been kicking around. Uh, I, I harangued, um, probably stalked politicians until such time as we got $240,000 um, for the Alfred, Sandra Kepich Arnold, who is the uh, director of nursing at the Alfred, um, and I pushed to get the first only, the first women's only ward, sorry, wing in the Alfred. And we did the, the results, uh, sorry, we did some research looking at the assaults before and the assaults after, and you don't have to be a genius to understand that the results were that following the implementation of a women's only ward, the assault rate went down. So the issue is there, the issue is not new, the issue is continuing, but it is time for action. It really is time for action and it's got to be a considered, concerted, long-lasting action and not like me, the angry voice um, that's one out there uh, throwing a bucket of water in the desert, but a con concerted, long-lasting action. And therefore, my meeting with Lynn Coulson Barr and B. Mitchell Dawson and Colleen Pierce um, was was like an absolute gift for me, because these are women who uh, have the 
knowledge of how to take uh, passion, anger, and harness it in a way that is bureaucratic speak, is politician speak, and um, through their teaching of, of me, how to actually um, harness, <laughs> harness my incredible um, concerns about justice, that this is the way forward. And I've been very, very fortunate to work with them. It's been a real, it's been a real um, pleasure, but also very educational. And I'm terribly grateful for B. Mitchell Dawson, who started, and with Lynn, of course, <coughs> this whole process. Uh, MAPRC, that's Monash Alfred Psychiatry Research Centre, which is the research centre that I direct, was commissioned um, by the Mental Health Complaints Commissioner to put together the research. And this is what, it's a very unsexy title, it's Sexual Safety of Women During Psychiatric Hospitalisation, Risk Factors, Consequences and Emerging Key Factors in Providing Trauma-Informed pa Inpatient Care. Dr Jasmine Grigg, my senior research fellow colleague, and I did the work for this literature review. I can't go through the whole review, and we will hope to publish that review in a um, journal as soon as possible, but you know, the ramifications of it are to try and get it out into all kinds of different um, literature so that it is not um, confined to literature that's really dry as dust. So the aim of the review was to look at the review of risk factors, to look at mental health and health consequences of the breaches of sexual safety experienced by women during mental health inpatient care, the provision of female inpatient trauma-informed care. And I, again, I agree with um, my colleague, Professor um, uh, Louise, in the, in the audience, who, you know, we've, we're sick of hearing trauma-informed care as a sort of mantra that doesn't really have anything attached to it. And that's part of this process as well, to make these things not just catchphrases that people glibly roll off the tongue, but to actually have some meaning behind that. And again, the review and the evaluation of current and emerging uh, strategies from around the world is, is looked at. So the, the methodology is a, is a standard uh, methodology, and these are the electronic searches, these were the search terms, and 148 references were included in the final paper, but that was actually out of 664 um, total reference number. The summarised findings are that we can look at it from different angles, but this is sexual safety incidents in the mental health inpatient setting. Sexual safety was defined as this, which is the recognition, respect and maintenance of physical and psychological boundaries between people. Australia and the US data indicates that between 5 and 45 per cent of patient, inpatients have experienced sexual violence during an admission. So the broad, uh, between 5 and 45, that's a huge variance, is because of the reporting. And again, we've just touched on that. When does it become considered to be sexual violence? Um, and that has subjective uh, aspects to it. The US data identified sexual behaviour amongst inpatients to be between 30 and 70 per cent. The UK data is important to consider separately because of their uh, particular model of care. So that, um, again, this is somewhat, this is the preceding their move to gender segregated wards, but over a two year period, 2003, 2005, there were 122 documented cases, including 19 cases of rape, 20 cases of consensual sex, 13 cases of, of exposure, 18 cases of sexual advances, 26 cases of touching and other incidents. So disturbingly, in that um, report, the majority of incidents were categorised as causing no degree of harm. Now that is just appalling. And that actually then triggered a whole lot of political action and that in fact led to the gender segregation of wards in 2008. The other important thing that happened was people got sued. And um, you know, when people are actually taken to court and uh, uh, government agencies were taken to court by individual women um, and sued that, in fact, that then pushed forward the uh, impetus for change. The research that's missing, I think, um, is, is, the, is really significant. So the ab there is an absence of Australian data reporting the relative risk of sexual assaults experienced by men and women in the mental health inpatient setting. I think that was raised before, and that is a really important factor that, that um, you know, we can imagine, but we don't have the full picture. 
Some data from large community-based studies suggest that 20 per cent of women with severe mental illness have experienced recent sexual assault compared to 8 per cent of men. Women with severe mental illness are more likely to be subjected to sexual violence than men. That's an important um, factor when we're looking at risk assessments. Extrapolating that community data to the mental health inpatient setting, we can easily see there that the sexual safety of inpatients, particularly women, is a critical issue and greater protection needs to be provided to prevent, to prevent assaults. Um, the LGBT, and it should have um, the rest of it there, it, it, and that comes from the international uh, terminology, it, there's very, very little research on the sexual safety of people who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender in inpatient care. And even currently there are disparities in inpatient care due to prejudice, stigma and lack of staff training, which then creates a vulnerability for LGBT people who may then have specific needs while undergoing mental health inpatient care, but it's ignored because of their sexual minority status. Older women also undergoing mental health inpatient treatment have been um, neglected, and similarly adolescents. Um, the whole area of adolescent psychiatry and the management of um, uh, you know, young uh, individuals together on an inpatient unit that has pro um, promotes things such as um, developing healthy relationships and so on um, is, is very, very difficult and fraught. And again, we need to consider what's going on in, these, in this situation. There are many risk factors that are looked at in the literature, and this includes patient factors in which low self-esteem, distress and social isolation and vulnerability are all associated with mental ill health. The inpatient environment, so again, physical inpatient environment, sedative properties of psychotropic medications, the institutional measures of control, inpatient unit cultures and responding to the incidents, perpetrators and risk and vulnerability assessments are all part of the treatment environment that need attention. The wider social factors are important because in mental health we know that what's going on in the broader sense, so in a psychosocial environmental sense, there is an inequity in, in terms of gender. Um, we know that from all sorts of uh, dimensions, including salaries and so on, that this then gets translated into the mental health sector and of course the gender inequities, the power inequities play out in the inpatient units as well. Gender-based sexual victimisation. I can get on another soapbox here, but the early life sexual abuse history is such a vital piece of information in understanding why this particular woman has got this particular problem and therefore what are we going to do to help her. I absolutely loathe, despise, hate the term borderline personality disorder and I'm on a bit of a campaign to see if we can do something about this ridiculous term that is actually highly stigmatising of women who with that label have, when we go back and look, about 85% have got a history of trauma, early life trauma. And therefore we should be thinking if this woman has made it in any way, shape or form in her life, got a job, got any kind of relationship, have any sense of, of, of purpose, we should be giving her a medal, not actually stigmatising and making out that she's a PD. I... It's, it's one of those inequities that makes my... <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to stop because this is just one of those things that I think we've got horribly wrong and it ties into what's happening in this situation with the re-traumatisation of the individual who comes from that background. So a number of us are trying to um, educate from medical students up, uh, banging that drum to say informed trauma approach must be real. It must be that we are teaching our young students, our registrars, our junior colleagues how to take a sensitive trauma history because more times than not the woman wants to talk about the horrors of what happened and we need to be able to work through it. Psychotherapists are excellent at this. This is what they do and yet we haven't somehow managed to translate that into mainstream practice and that's one of the things that we really need to get going with. So again, this plays into some of the issues that we're talking about today in, in the whole setup of safety. 
Cumulative abuse is also another factor of this condition because if the low self-esteem is propagated, then the person hasn't got the resources to be able to feel worthy of something valuable like a really nice relationship or somebody else who values that particular woman. And then re-victimisation in adulthood follows because, again, that very poor um, self-esteem plays out in so many different ways. So the cost of female inpatient sexual victimisation is huge. There are obviously the health consequences of female inpatient sexual victimisation. And a little known uh, correlation is the um, correlation between hormonal um, disruption and early life abuse, for example. This is some of the work that's being done, looking at such things as endocrine disruptors, so that this is a person who has premenstrual exacerbation of the, of the self-harm and other conditions, that this is a person who is going to have a greater propensity for diabetes and so on, just by the fact that early life abuse disrupts the normal um, development in terms of circuitry, in terms of hormones and so on. It can be reversed. This is not concrete. Right? But again, we need to understand the health consequences of early life abuse as it plays out further down the track. The mental health consequences are, of course, enormous of female inpatient sexual victimisation as a result of re-traumatisation and, again, the public health. Childhood sexual abuse appears to be the main risk factor for sexual victimisation in adulthood. And it's one of those issues that people shy away from, but again, when we have the discussion, we find that in our... I have a women's mental health clinic which has a waiting list of 200 people because it's a Medicare-funded clinic, and the biggest, commonest discussions are about listening to what has happened in early life. And the childhood sexual abuse stories are there and need to be worked through. Um, and again, we need to bring that into mainstream work. Arguably, female inpatient sexual victimisation a lot of the time is a case of re-victimisation. And as such, there's a whole range of ripple effects from that re-victimisation and we need to stop it to actually help our women to move forward with their lives. So this is a, a trauma-informed care and practice uh, model that's brought from the literature, but, I mean, it's got to be a real trauma-informed care and practice, not just a glib phrase. I don't have time to go into it, but um, we will make it available. And, again, the headings for trauma-informed principles derive from the literature and very familiar, I'm sure, to this audience. So um, in critically evaluating current and emerging trauma-informed care strategies, most of the information, interestingly, comes from what's called grey literature, which is the non-peer-reviewed journals. So again, we have an issue with mainstreamed or the prestigious journals that everybody tries to get their publications into carry very little about this, but the actual grey literature has a lot more. So the US-based organisations lead the way on this, and particularly the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors uh, puts out quite a lot of inf important information. They all agree on the key principles of trauma-informed care, that people need to feel connected, valued, informed and hopeful of recovery. The connection between childhood trauma and mental illness in adults is understood by all staff, and that's a really important um, key principle to, to get across, and that staff are mindful and empowering in their work with individuals, family and friends to promote and protect the autonomy of the individual. Right, my view. I'm impatient. I've seen the problems. I've, 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 I can't tell you how many times um, I've felt so sad and horrified and angry with what I've seen. I personally think we need to, this is just me speaking, not the committee, etc. I personally think we need to take it um, to a, a very definitive stand and have a really good go at the solution of gender segregation. Um, because if we don't do something dramatic and, and definitive, I think the problem will continue for some time. And I don't think generations are going to look back at us and say, what the hell were you doing? This is just not on. So um, we've seen, uh, and I heard the, the, um, the, the woman who told us her back of the envelope calculation for the costings, but there are possibilities of doing things where many services have two wards, 
they, they will you know, often have just two wards. Um, why not think about making one a female, one a male? And then people say, well, what about the people who are transgender or other issues? Well, I might be being simple, but why don't we ask them? Why don't we ask them what is their choice? And choice is a really important um, aspect of it all. But again, it might be that the modification of the physical environment, one of the most concrete things we can do in psychiatry when everything else is airy-fairy, it might be that this is an important way forward to perhaps you know, being able to, t to talk to our Middle Eastern and Asian colleagues when they just look at us shaking their heads. So there has been considerable discussion about the benefits of ward segregation. And um, there is quite a lot of support in the literature for this, particularly the UK um, evidence, but also um, other areas where smaller steps have been taken. Uh, um, our own research, as I've mentioned, uh, did find that establishing female-only areas decreased the um, uh, incidences and improved safety and experience for female individuals. Against the ward segregation argument is that the factor that compromises the sexual safety is whether, they are over, whether people are overseen by staff of the same sex. So again, multiple studies have revealed repeated incidences, unfortunately, this is more international than local, um, in, in unfortunate incidences of inpatient sexual assault perpetrated by staff members. Access to choice, again, that word choice is, is another vital part about all of this, and maybe that, that might be another part of the um, single sex ward. My good friend and colleague, Sue Armstrong, who um, is here, um, has made a film. Are we showing the film anytime soon, Sue? Um, the Great. It's called Impatient. Um, and Sue has been a mover and shaker in the women's only ward movement. Wow. Um, and so please talk to Sue um, because she will be able to also uh, enforce the, the view that some of us have. Now, I'm not speaking for everybody, and I know that, the, that there are people who will disagree with it, but I just want to say that if we need to do something definitive, we need to do it what, now. What, what I would say is uh, I'm a psychiatrist, but if you find our flyer, it's got one of my beautiful drawings on it. So please, have a chat to Sue and find the, the flyers and so on. But in conclusion, Sexual assault incidents experienced by women in the mental health inpatient are a significant public health, criminal, civil rights, human rights and systems issue. The consequences of sexual victimisation are staggering. It has health, mental health, ethical, legal, educational and economic implications. Protecting and safeguarding the safety of acutely unwell female inpatients must be amongst the critical function of mental health services. Trauma-informed care practice is urgently needed and it's got to be real and um, all of us who are involved in any of the educational um, processes, we, we need to really get into this in a big way and um, be actually educating. One brave registrar once said to me, I'd love to be able to do this but no one has ever taught me how. So I think that's a significant point that we've got to, we've got to be educating people from all the disciplines who are involved in care about what exactly is this? What does it mean? And it can't be a phrase. Environmental change, I've banged on that drum um, a lot, but cultural change. Um, cultural change is really, really important because people feel overwhelmed in the uh, mental health services by the issue. They're, they're often well-meaning, but you get this kind of, yeah, I realise this is a really terrible problem, but what can I do? response. And that's got, to, that's got to be turned around as well. And it's really important that um, we think about all the different things that can be done at a real level and the recommendations for the report um, are very, very practical ones through to you know, system-wide change. So overall though, we can't lose track of the fact that mental health services have a responsibility to provide a safe therapeutic environment for all service users. We need to do much better for her. Thank you.